We're going to be um, covering today two topics um, in this PD webinar that's being hosted by the um, Renal Association in the UK and by ISPV. And we're going to be looking at um, access um, and we're going to be looking at infection, which I'm sure everybody will agree is two um, major areas which are like bottlenecks in, in being able to run a high quality um, peritoneal dialysis service and be able to have access to peritoneal dialysis and to actually keep people on peritoneal dialysis. So we've got an interesting hour and a half ahead of us. Um, we've built in um, quite a bit of time for discussion. So I would urge you to put your comments into the Q and A um, box in, uh, in, in the, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll pick those up during the uh, Q&A. So I'm chairing the first bit and um, my colleague Mark Lambie will be chairing the infection. So we're going to start off with um, Richard Corbett, uh, who works with me at Imperial, um, who's going to be presenting um, a difficult case in terms of um, PD access. Uh, and I've always um, said to, to this patient that if he hadn't seen me, it was unlikely that he would have ever got on to PD, at least probably not um, in, in the UK. Thank you, Edwina. So um, in the, I think it's helpful to, in the section on access that we're going to talk about this afternoon, to perhaps start with a case just to frame that discussion. So uh, we're, the, the individual we're, I'm going to talk about it was a, is a 39 and certainly when he presented to an advanced kidney care clinic in late 2017 was a 39 year old insurance broker. He had a diagnosis made quite firmly of polycystic kidney disease and had previously this had been diagnosed in the context of a episode of pulmonary edema 10 years previously when he'd also been found to have a dilated cardiomyopathy which was the cause of which despite extensive investigation was unclear there was no strong family history of polycystic kidney disease his gfr at that time when first diagnosed was around 47 mils per minute but by end of 2017 it was 10 mils per minute and this was confirmed by an edta gfr he was an active uh, insurance broker and very keen as many patients are uh, on a home treatment. He was placed into transplant workup and this progressed as, uh, as the, the desirable form of renal replacement therapy for a 39 year old man. And in assessment, and it was clear that he was mobile, um, had ample space at home to support peritoneal dialysis and lived alone. However, the great setback and drawback to undertaking peritoneal dialysis was his weight. He was 179 kilograms with an associated BMI of 60 um, at a height of just 1.7 meters. So I suppose the question that would be posed by this patient, uh, this person wanting to do dialysis at home, is does obesity preclude his peritoneal dialysis? I know Brigio is going to talk in a moment about the, the RA response to the ISPD guidance on PD access. Um, clearly, the most appropriate choice of catheter placement is one that allows a, a catheter to lie within the pelvis, but also allows the person doing, doing their own dialysis to have easy access and easy sight of their exit site. This image, which is reproduced from the guidelines and reproduced from John, some of John Crabtree's work, shows some of the more conventional at the top peritoneal dialysis catheter sites, but also some of the more con unconventional with C being what we'd call an extended peritoneal dialysis catheter for the slightly more obese individual coming over the <coughs> anterior abdominal wall. And then finally a D, which is a, a true pre-sternal catheter with a very high rising uh, exit site. But clearly, um, the last two are less easy to place. I'm fortunate, we're fortunate to work in the centre, and Frank Dore is going to talk as part of the uh, session that towards the end, uh, who has an experience and interest in peritoneal dialysis access. And I think one of the things that we will talk about is the importance to have different interests and different expertise within a centre. So he placed a laparoscopic uh, 
peritoneal dialysis catheter with an extension uh, at the beginning of January 2018, but, uh, due to the progressive uremic symptoms in this individual. The peritoneal dialysis, you can see here on the on the left slide, the course of the peritoneal dialysis catheter in this individual and the exit site where it came out uh, towards the upper abdomen and gives you an idea of the size of the individual when lying flat. Clearly, if you'd had a conventionally sighted exit site, either around the umbilicals or a little bit lower, may have interfered with the belt line, which you can, I think, you can probably see well marked on this patient, uh, or indeed would have been invisible to the hand. So you had a 42 centimeter catheter placed into the pelvis. The patient did not require an intermentopexin. Uh, Frank will talk perhaps a bit at the end about rectus sheath tunneling, which was undertaken. He then had a tunneled extension placed to allow the exit site on the upper abdomen. And after a brief overnight admission, the individual wasn't on CPAP and didn't require uh, uh, respiratory support and underwent the, undertook general anesthetic without great problems. He returned home the next day and then trained and started on to CAPD in February 2018. It's worth reflecting that the great barrier to him for transplantation was uh, clearly his significant weight in his BMI. And eight months after starting peritoneal dialysis, he underwent a laparoscopic sleeve, sleeve gastrectomy at another center. And that the perioperative phase and that was managed with his resid residual renal function. So he came off peritoneal dialysis preoperatively and stayed off dialysis for two weeks um, before being restarted with reduced fill volumes. One of the important factors of multidisciplinary working is that Frank, who had placed the PD catheter, was involved in ensuring that the surgeons at the time of the, bar the bariatric surgery uh, did not go through this tract here. And so the track of the subcutaneous catheter was marked preoperatively to allow catheter preservation. Just a, under a year after he'd had sleeve gastrectomy, he'd lost enough weight to have a BMI of 40 and was activated on the transplant list at that point. Bringing us forward to the current day, he's now 95 kilograms, has a BMI that is uh, nearly uh, in the obese rather than the morbidly obese category. He's doing well with peritoneal dialysis, performed three bags a day, five days a week, and has not, uh, not required a significant increment on his dialysis prescription. He remains well, very active with a personal trainer, and his dialysis, the nature of peritoneal dialysis has managed, meant that he's outside of times of COVID, that he's allowed him to travel internationally, both for work and for recreation. Reflecting the site in the exit site, he's not had exit site infections and has done well without any peritonitis episodes. So I hope you take away from this case that where you have a multidisciplinary team interested in the delivery of peritoneal dialysis, it is possible to overcome it, it, uh, problems like obesity uh, and indeed polycystic kidney disease should, should not preclude effective access for peritoneal dialysis. And indeed, I think one of the things we may touch on at the end is access for PD is not a one size fits all approach. Thank you, Richard. Thanks for keeping to time. So our next speaker is um, Brigu Sood, who is a consultant uh, at St. Helier who actively puts in lots of percutaneous catheters, um, as does Richard, of course. And, um, but he has been responsible for pulling together the response of the UK Renal Association to the recent ISPD um, updated guideline on PD access. Over to you, Brigham. Thank you, Edwina. Um, I'd be talking about the PD access guidelines uh, some key aspects of it from UK perspective. Um, let me just show. I hope you can see the screen. So poor uptake of PD um, as a renal replacement therapy remains a challenge for UK PD community or overall UK renal community. Over years, despite increasing the dialysis population, the proportion of PD uh, use has not increased significantly. This recent renal registry report shows that only about 20% of the patients start PD as a modality at the start of uh, dialysis. And in addition to this low uptake at start, this significant dropout contributes to low PD use as well. Um, about 60% of the patients are left on peritoneal dialysis at the end of one year after starting PD and only 22% at the end of three years. So this significant attrition contributes to low PD use. And the causes of catheter failure are mixed, infection and non-infection related, and uh, irrespective of 
the insertion technique, a lot of catheter failure is seen. And it's highlighted in other registry data as well, not just in the UK, that about a quarter of the patients would have a significant catheter-related event within six months of start of PD. These are the events that require interruption of PD or admission to hospital. And a lot of these patients would transfer to hemodialysis within the first six months of starting um, PD. Now, as uh, Richard mentioned, the practice in uh, UK for PD catheter insertion is uh, varied. You can see that uh, about half of the units use a hybrid medical insertion, surgical insertion pathways for PD access. And in these units, uh, as few as 10% to as many as 100% of catheters are inserted by a non-surgical technique. Um, more importantly, the catheter failure rate varies quite significantly amongst the UK units. And this can be as high as 50% uh, reported in some units within the first year. Um, so this all highlights that the um, improving PD quality, access, quality of PD access is key variable in, in improving utilization of PD um, in patients with end-stage renal failure. There are a large number of studies reporting uh, cohort data um, of various techniques. Uh, the results of these studies are non-uniform, sometimes very conflicting. There are um, few studies which uh, have uh, reported randomized control data between uh, certain techniques, um, but again, with inconsistent outcomes. And patient population in these randomized control trials might not be fully representative of uh, all the patients we see, uh, for example, the one which Richard discussed, because they would be excluded for, uh, for various reasons because they are not suitable to one technique or another. So to establish a statistical significance with the data from studies with conflicting results, a few meta-analyses have been published. The meta-analysis suggests uh, in, in some findings lower infection rates, uh, for example, with percutaneous catheter insertion um, or lower uh, mechanical complications in laparoscopic uh, catheter insertion. But even these findings are affected by the fact that meta-analysis combine the data from randomized controlled trials with the cohort data, uh, resulting in significant heterogeneity and uh, reducing the confidence in these results. Uh, recently, there is a good meta-analysis published on advanced laparoscopic technique. These are the techniques involving rectus sheath tunneling of the catheters and adhesiolysis and omentopexy uh, and such interventions at the time of catheter insertion. And I'm sure Frank would be talking about it further. This shows significant reduction in mechanical failure rates of the catheter, um, but no difference in infection rates. One of the challenge uh, in interpreting these uh, meta-analyses has been that they tend to group together various surgical approaches. Um, and uh, on the other hand, also different percutaneous techniques, thereby making it difficult to tease out the, any specific uh, contribution of technique to improvement in, in catheter outcomes. There are only a few interventions in the guidelines that are supported by good quality evidence, like use of prophylactic antibiotic before catheter insertion, or the fact that catheter type doesn't influence the complication rates. And combination of RCT data with cohort data, as I said, increases heterogeneity and, and reduces confidence in the results. It's also important to bear in mind that the successful PD program not only relies on a good catheter outcome, but also a, a, in a very responsive and a resilient access, PD access service. Um, many units don't have access to all the techniques and interventions suggested in the guidelines. Uh, and as um, uh, the case we discussed highlights that you need a multidisciplinary team with different skill sets to allow more and more patients to access PD. Recently in COVID pandemic, it was highlighted that uh, the units where there is a resilient PD access pathway um, um, allowed PD patients to access PD even in, in such difficult time and also helped with the care of some uh, patients in ICUs um, who were overwhelmed with the need for renal replacement therapy. Uh, there is some registry data, it's not causation, but association uh, from UK as well as Canadian registry to suggest that the uptake of PD might be um, helped by having a hybrid uh, PD pathway, but this needs to be confirmed in a, in a good quality study. 
Um, the ISPD guidelines highlighted some innovation, innovative uh, approaches to salvage catheter. As I said, a lot of catheters are lost because of complications uh, which are infection related. And these techniques, although only supported by um, single uh, case series from individual units, but uh, do highlight that there are other options available to save the catheters um, and avoid mm -hmm. catheter loss. But because of the strength of evidence being weak, it'll be important that any unit uh, taking up these techniques would uh, need to have a rigorous audit process behind it to show that their outcomes are comparable to the published data. A lot of UK units participated in UK catheter study. This is a well-designed observational study to assess the influence of many aspects of PD pathway on modality failure. It looks at the influence of patient and facility factors in addition to the technique used for catheter insertion. Uh, due to the pandemic, the ISPD, EuroPD conference was delayed. So we only had first chance uh, to glimpse the result, early results of catheter study during the virtual conference in March. And I'm looking forward to James's presentation uh, shortly afterwards. We hope that further analysis of the data from this study will help us understand UK practices and outcomes, especially variation in practice in various units on infection and non-infection related complications. It might inform us about responsiveness of different pathways, including ability to restart PD after catheter loss. Um, this might help further tease out the difference in outcome between basic and advanced tech laparoscopic techniques, and also blind and image assisted PD catheter insertion. Because these are the aspects of PD catheter insertion techniques that has been highlighted in, uh, as an improvement uh, uh, um, plan in, in the ISPD guidelines. Uh, from my, what I understand, uh, North American PD registry is even looking at a practitioner level data to see if the difference in outcomes are purely related to the technique or are significantly influenced by the expertise of the practitioners. Um, we had Mr. Casaris and Dr. Reed on the panel and who, who have extensive experience in uh, using PD in pediatric population. They informed guidelines of any variation in practice which are specific to this group of patients. So further increasing the scope of use of these guidelines. One of the challenges is that studies have mainly focused on major catheter outcomes, uh, like catheter uh, infection or catheter loss. But for a patient, uh, sometimes the morbidity associated with minor complications or loss of catheter resulting in a long time on hemodialysis might have more important implication than uh, what happened to the initial catheter. So understanding a patient experience of the whole PD pathway is imperative to improve outcomes of PD programs. Um, and as I said, many units don't have access to all the techniques which have been described in ISPD guidelines. So it's important to broaden the skill set of the clinicians involved in PD access to enable more patients to have access to PD with availability of range of insertion techniques and catheter salvage techniques to reduce the catheter loss. Um, at the moment, as PD community, we have rightly focused on reducing peritonitis rates as target for quality improvement in PD, but a good quality PD access is central to good patient experience and sustaining a good PD program. And UK catheter study would be an excellent guide to design a future audit strategy by seeing which are the key points in, uh, as a targets for improvement. We need good quality data. As I said, we, we are struggling with that, uh, despite a lot of work done on PD access. And UK catheter study has demonstrated that UK renal community can deliver well-designed studies to build evidence to better guide the next update of these guidelines. Um, I would like to thank my co-authors for their efforts over the last two years in helping uh, write these guidelines and also to the Renal Association Guidelines Committee for their supervision. Thank you. Well, thank you, Brigu. Um, so we're going to move on to the next talk which is being given um, by James Fotheringham, uh, who uh, will works in Sheffield and has been involved with the analysis of the UK catheter study. So over to you, James. Thank you, Edwina, uh, and thank you to the Arena Association for inviting me to give this talk. So I'm going to talk about the UK cath study, the emerging clinical take-home messages. We're coming towards the end of this analysis. Um, I've been brilliantly set up by Rigu, um, who is um, 
who's talked a lot about catheter insertion techniques. So this is a PD catheter. And we're primarily interested in the medical versus surgical catheter insertion. And why has this been the case? This is because um, existing UK renal registry data has suggested that percutaneous or medically inserted catheters here um, have got inferior outcomes, i.e. their survival is lower compared to the other personal catheter insertion techniques. OK, but this finding needs to be balanced with a lot of what Briggy just said, which is around the responsiveness and resilience of the medical or hybrid uh, insertion technique or pathway. So one might perceive that you could put medical catheters more quickly in late presenters or uh, unplanned starts. Individuals who are on maintenance hemodialysis but need to come off for a range of reasons. Um, it negates any issues around access to theatre space, which has definitely been uh, an issue, particularly during COVID period, but many of us encounter that problem during um, more normal times. And also during resource constraints like um, capacity, outpatient hemodialysis capacity. So I'm going to talk to you uh, about the UK CATH study, how it was designed to answer some of these questions. And I'm going to answer, because it's clinical take-home messages here, uh, the potential views or questions in this area. So who does medical catheters anyway? Some people might say that the patients that get medical catheters are different, or indeed the centres that do them are different. A perception that, and depending on your viewpoint, that medical or surgical catheters do worse. Um, and it, we might think that maybe medical catheters are cheaper to insert. So let's talk about the UK cath study. So the UK CATH study is nested in the PDOPS or Peritoneal Dialysis Outcomes and Practice Pattern Study, which is a, an international study that you'll, you may hear more about later on in this webinar. And that study started collecting data on patients once they were at home trained on PD. But we're actually interested in the Peritoneal Dialysis Catheter, which happens way earlier in the, in the pathway. So the UK CATH study actually recruited patients at the point where the de a decision was made to insert a peritoneal dialysis catheter and then uses bespoke instruments to capture important relevant patient data and outcomes at the, at the point around the procedure, the patient's training, and looks at those with a view to identifying their association with a specific outcome. And that is what we've called a catheter event. And a catheter event is a combination of um, several things. So we were particularly interested in further operative procedures relating to uh, addressing catheter function, exocyte infections and uh, tunnel, uh, tunnel infections and peritonitis. So we'll call these catheter related infections and also admission for catheter related problems. So let's answer some of those clinical questions. So who, who even does medical catheters anyway? So in the UK CATH study, we were able to um, analyze 769 first peritoneal dialysis catheter insertions. Uh, and we had a mean of a, just shy of 18 catheter insertions per participating center. And we wanted a broad range of centers here. But as Brigu showed, um, possibly more importantly, was that we were able to replicate some of the existing registry data on the uh, the numbers of centres who were doing a primarily surgical insertion technique, which is the top half of my figure here, where all of the catheters were inserted surgically, or had a medical or hybrid catheter insertion pathway where some of the catheters were inserted medically and some surgically, or indeed all of them inserted medically. So what about the question, the statement, Patients who get medical catheters are different. So I've, I'm just showing you what I think you would want to see from such a table. So similar ages, similar genders, similar BMIs, whether your insertion is surgical or medical. OK, let's move down to where differences are. So you'll see here that patients with congestive cardiac failure, there's a higher incidence of these patients in the medical insertion pathway. Now, that could be because people were worried about a general anaesthetic um, uh, in these people with these cardiac comorbidities, or it could be that these centers could put people presenting with heart failure on peritoneal dialysis as a therapy because they did medical insertions. You'll notice that um, 
these hereditary and cystic and congenital causes of end stage renal failure were higher in the surgical pathway. And I think this is probably, and the same with glomerulonephritis, and this is probably because these people have a more predictable progression rate that means that you know when they're going to need their surgical catheter inserted. But similar rates of what we might class as late presentation between medical and surgical. Are the centres different that do medical catheters? Well, we see similar differences here. I will draw your attention to one of these hypotheses, which is that patients, uh, that centres that have a hybrid pathway might put more patients on PD, but we didn't really see that. The prevalence of PD patients in the first year was about 20% whether you were surgical pathway or a hybrid pathway. But the hybrid pathway seemed to be associated with a larger center size. So what about outcomes here? So do, uh, which is better, medical or surgical, which does worse? So here is a figure, this is a graph showing the rate of people um, from peritoneal diastasis experiencing death in the purple line, transferring to HD in the green line, or having a kidney transplant in the blue line. Okay, and these lines are a bit exaggerated for statistical reasons, which I won't go into. But patients can have catheter events at a range of times. So they can have it just after the catheter is inserted, but before they're established on PD, or they can have a catheter event once they're established on PD, um, so sometime after that. And what we see is that uh, the rate of these is similar. Uh, so here we've got yellow people who are on PD having a catheter event, and red being people who have just had their catheter inserted, um, experiencing it. And there's the composite endpoint again. So that's the rate that people are experiencing it. But we should look at these according to whether they were inserted medically or surgically. So here on the left-hand side, we've got them having events just after, in the period of time between having the catheter inserted and them starting PD. And on the right, we've got them having a catheter event once they're established on PD. And you'll see here in the, um, the blue, at least in this early period, the surgical catheter event rate is higher because the period of time without, the time to which a patient experiences a catheter event is shorter. And here on the right hand side, you'll see the survival without a catheter event in the surgical arm is again shorter than in the medical arm. And so that translate to a translates to a statistically uh, significant difference, certainly on the right-hand side, once people are established on peritoneal dialysis, uh, and has a uh, of 0.77 and has a similar effect size, so a similar protective effect with the medical catheter in people who have just had their catheter inserted but aren't established on HD. So. What about the cost arguments? Is it cheaper to insert medical catheters? So how do we do this? So we've got a range of data. So we looked at NHS reference costs, uh, which are cost submissions from the different NHS trusts. And we categorized centers into surgical where they were all surgically inserted or medical where they had over 70% insertions medical. And what you see is that the reference cost submissions that these centers submit are quite different. So surgical centers, report about an 1800 pound um, insertion cost to NHS Digital, whereas medical centers report about an 800 pound uh, insertion cost. So what does this all add to, up to in the NHS? So does the medical catheter pathway cost the NHS less? So I've shown you that the catheter event rate is lower in medical catheters. So that means you need fewer medical catheter, fewer catheter insertions in the hybrid or medical pathway. You have fewer catheter events in the hybrid pathway. Because there's fewer events, there are fewer people transitioning onto HD and in the hybrid and more in the surgical. And the time that patients receive PD in the hybrid or predominantly medical pathway is longer in years than in the surgical and they spend less time on HD. So this all adds up, but not to a huge difference. So the hybrid pathway across the lifetime of the patients, the dialysis related costs total up to about uh, 392,000 versus 393,000 
if you have a surgical pathway. So it, there's a cost saving of about 1200 pounds. But because the quality of life of patients who intended to have PD but ended up on HD is lower than those people who started on PD and stayed on PD, there's also a quality adjusted life year benefit. So what have I told you? I've told you that around half the UK centres are able to insert medical catheters through having a hybrid pathway. That the patient and centre differences according to insertion technique or pathway are perhaps less than we originally perceived. Medical catheters are associated with a comparable or perhaps even superior outcomes associated to their surgical counterparts. And the medical catheter insertion technique or pathway is associated with lower costs. And I've not told you much about the methods there. Do please email me if you would like to see my fuller ISBD presentation about all the techniques involved. It remains for me to thank the Arbor Research Programme for supporting this research, the NIHR for funding it and the Clinical Research Network and the participants, uh, centres and clinical staff for making this research happen. Thank you. Well, thank you, James. Um, we will now start the panel discussion. Um, so please put your questions into the Q&A. So I'm going to um, start off with, with um, asking James for some clarity on, on the um, UK CAT study. So when you talk about medical, you are really talking about hybrid, aren't you? So this depends, thank you, Edwina. This depends on whether you're talking about how you put your catheter in or how you organize your renal units, yeah. okay? So in uh, the graphs, the survival graphs I showed you, I was largely talking about how you insert your catheter, okay? Yeah. Medical versus surgical. When I'm actually talking about the health economics, I'm talking about how you design your service, okay? okay? And obviously the people who choose the who with the surgical catheters, particularly from your hybrid units, are going to be the more complex patients. You're absolutely right. So they get to, uh, you've got a clinician deciding which technique is right for that individual as opposed yeah. to a surgical yeah. pathway where they all get it. So I'm going to um, ask Frank Dorr to say something. Um, Frank is uh, the surgeon who works at Imperial, uh, but he he has also um, co-wrote the, uh, co-chaired the um, ISPD guideline um, group that produced the updated guideline that Brigu sort of commented on. Uh, so in, in terms of, if we really focus on the case that, that Richard presented, Frank, do you think um, that there is any way he could have had a percutaneous catheter? He weighed 190 kilos, I've just checked. Um, my um, first set of notes, which uh, um, while during this session, he was 186 kilos with a BMI of over 60. Um, it, is, is it ever going to be possible just to have a purely medical um, approach to putting in catheters? Yeah, thanks, Edwina. I think you know, nothing is impossible, but I would not render it a safe method to do so. Um, I think in general, whether or not you use ultrasound to guide your insertion, if you do a percutaneous insertion, um, in this type of patient with a huge amount of subcuticular tissue, so to speak, um, and also a massive, uh, he was young and still had uh, very sturdy muscles. Um, on top of that, polycystic kidneys that were not even the biggest ones we've seen, but definitely they were reaching into the pelvis and you, you have a few risks there. So I think the a priori risk of failure will be uh, very, very high, and I would not recommend that. Um, so I think that that obviously blurs the picture, and it was rightfully highlighted by James and yourself, that obviously with um, the field of PD expanding and hopefully many more people wanting to get this technique, we should be ready and that there should not be technical exclusions for PD patients. That my that is my big thing in life uh, when we talk about PD, to make it possible for everyone. I agree. And, and the message that's certainly coming out from the ISPD um, is, is that really virtually anybody can do PD. Um, there's hardly any absolute exclusion to being on peripheral dialysis, apart from being homeless and in no fixed abode. Um, can I perhaps clarify a little bit on the terminology, because uh, I might be one of the few surgeons in this call. 
Um, but when we talk about a surgical catheter, I mean, you're basically talking about, uh, it could be an, an open insertion on the general anesthetic or on the local done by a surgeon. It could be basic laparoscopy, meaning just uh, having the laparoscope in to guide your insertion into the pelvis. Uh, and it could be the advanced uh, laparoscopy, meaning that uh, you have the basic laparoscopy plus uh, additional procedures to, to prevent mechanical issues, so to speak. And, uh, fixing the catheter in the right position and preventing um, issues later on. And, and that's that, really important for when you come to read the literature because yeah. um, he, you know, it, it's not always clear as to which group people fall into. So looking at there's now a whole lot of questions coming through on, on the Q&A. So one of the questions um, is what is the usual training that physicians get for medical PD catheter insertions in the UK? So I'm going to pass that over to you, Bregu. Um, <laughs> thank you, Edwina. Uh, Edwina, uh, firstly, about the medical PD catheter insertion in people with very large BMI. Um, if we look at the studies uh, or the, even the registry data, unless all these units who are doing 80 to 90% catheters with medical catheters are excluding everybody who's borderline, that would be unfortunate. In our experience, the limitation is the thickness of anterior abdominal wall. So people are high BMI in different ways. People are circumferentially large. But as long as your anterior abdominal wall thickness is shorter than the split sheet we insert the catheter with, we insert PD catheter in people with fairly high BMIs. And we haven't found a big association of catheter failure with BMIs. But it's not published. It's just a unit experience. Uh, and there's going to be very little published data uh, about it. And about training the, the physicians get is, is purely based on where you are and who you work with. So I worked at Brighton with Steve Holt, and he was an uh, enthusiast of PD, and he trained me in doing PD catheters blindly. When I started working at St. Elliot Hospital, I, we, use, uh, we do a lot of interventions, so I trained... Uh, uh, myself and my colleagues in doing ultrasound guided PD catheter insertions. And now we have trained some of our uh, medical as well as surgical colleagues in doing percutaneous PD catheter insertion in neighboring units. But there is no structured PD catheter training program. And I think that's the need, just like with advanced laparoscopic techniques, you know, we need to find a way to upskill our colleagues so that when a patient needs these techniques, all these techniques are available. I agree. Um, so, so I'm going to cut you off because there's a whole series of other questions coming through um, and I don't want to leave them unanswered. So there's another question for you, James. Um, did the UK catheter study explore embedded catheters? Um, we had the capacity to capture that. Thank you for the question. But actually we found the numbers were pretty small. Uh, so um, I think naturally the, the renal uh, UK PD community wants lots of answers from us about uh, these kind of practices um, and we are slightly limited by uh, if the practice was particularly uncommon so I don't think we're going to be able to tell you much about that. Okay um, and then there's a question is is there any evidence on the benefit of weighted catheters which I'll pass over to Frank. Just about to type. Uh, and not yeah. to my knowledge and we've looked quite extensively also on a meta-analytical level uh, at that time when we did it so unless it's something really recent, I haven't come across that. Because that must have been something you looked at when you did the ISPD guideline. Yes, and also in a previous meta-analysis, but um, there has not been, it, it makes sense to a certain extent, but uh, there's no evidence. Okay, and then there's an interesting question, which I will throw open to, to the panel, and maybe Mark, if you want to join this one as well. Do we need, and this is from Saeed Ahmed, who, who I trained to put in PD catheters, I think, a long time ago, percutaneously. Um, do we need a UK PD catheter registry? Well, I did notice that um, we do have James Medcalf on the webinar, which is quite useful, um, as he's the medical director for the... You'll have to type into the chat, though. Yeah. Um, but, I mean... Uh, it's certainly, we, we have discussed how to improve PD related data in the UK registry. Um, I think our first priority probably is going to end up having to be peritonitis because of reasons that we'll see in the next half of the webinar. Um, but yes, access was the other thing that we've, um, that's been 
there's fair consensus around that that's probably this the other priority that we would like to get better data on i think it's going to be a bit more difficult to get data on than for peritonitis but it's certainly something that we would should be looking to explore um wh whether we'd set up something separately I'm, I'm not sure that would likely work but there and the other point to make is of course that there is access data collected as part of the registry already in that it does do the multi-site dialysis access audit so it's not pd specific and we don't get quite the granularity you might do if you had a pd catheter registry by itself but we do get still some basic outcome data and that's really some of this data that's already been shown today okay and we we haven't really had a nursing perspective at all and and uh and, and certainly um patients must know notice a difference um in terms of the ease of percutaneous catheter insertions um, GAs and the organization. Um, so Sally, would you want to, I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> Sally, you need to, yeah, okay. Because the experience I've read, well, yeah, I've been around since I've, I've done my insertions. <laughs> um, I have to get that back here in Imperial. Um, but yes, I do agree. It, it, it was quite an experience to get that set up and it's, it is an experience to get the process through with uh, patients. As opposed to from a nursing perspective, um, our approach is different uh, for uh, more for uh, the psychosocial and emotional support for the patients and in preparing them uh, for, for the access, I must say. Um, Certainly, from my personal point of view, it was kind of personal. I would say I would try and make all my efforts to actually meet with the patient beforehand. Um, I'm sure my colleagues in the medical field would, would also have that opportunity. But um, certainly, we are more hands on, um, even up to uh, the setting up of the, uh, the rooms and equipment and all the processes uh, that take place during the insertion. Uh, up to the pre-op and up to the post-op and, and basically some continuity um, when we do the flow of the process of the insertion. Very good. Well, thank you, everybody. I think we, um, time moves on and we're going to move on to the second half of the webinar, um, which is going to be focusing on infection. Um, and um, Mark Lambie is going to be chairing that. So over to you, Mark. Hey, thank you. So I'm, I'm just going to have to introduce myself, I'm afraid. So I'm going to crack straight on with the uh, talk. So I'm just going to get the slides up. Um, so I'm just going to show the some data from PDOPS. So this is an international thing. So it, it is primarily focused on the UK, but I think quite a lot of the lessons are probably going to be more generally applicable anyway. Quick disclosures slide. I've had some done some talks at some point. Um, the so the the first thing I would say is that uh, peritonitis is far and away the most common cause of transferred hemodialysis globally. So these are looking at the outcomes from PDOPS by country, and you can see that the blue bars represent the percentage of transfers to HD due to peritonitis. So the average is 47% internationally. Uh, Thailand probably slightly higher at 61. UK coming in at second at 53%, but not actually that far away from some of the other ones. Japan, Canada possibly being quite low at 35%. We also know that the uptake of evidence-based practices is variable between centers. So going to the guidelines, so Peritonitis is relatively unusual in that we actually have some grade 1A recommendations in peritoneal dialysis. So we've actually got, this is one of the few areas in peritoneal dialysis we've actually got quite good evidence for. And we've got a 1A that there should be daily topical application of an antibiotic cream or ointment to the exit site. Still fairly high level evidence, 1B, that we should recommend antifungal prophylaxis when PD patients receive antibiotic courses to prevent fungal peritonitis. So looking at the distribution of practices in relation to the exit sites, you can see that this is split up by country. So looking purely at the UK, 
we can see that 47% of the centres use exit site mupiracin, 24% use intranasal mupiracin, but not on the exit site, and 29% of the centres didn't use anything. Um, it's highly variable between countries as well. Um, and even in Japan, they, they, they do very little there. So the, the uptake is incredibly variable. If we look at the antifungal prophylaxis, it's not quite so variable, but the striking thing here is that, I mean, I think most people know this, that the vast majority of centres don't use antifungal prophylaxis for peritonitis, apart from in Australia and New Zealand, and that's really just a David Johnson effect because they, they've had a national push on that. But it does raise the question that if you've had a fungal peritonitis, almost certainly the catheters come out, and potentially that was a preventable episode. Um, just to give you some slightly more, more context around other practices, exit site cleaning strategy, so much more evidence-free zone, but you can see that it's incredibly variable between centres what they do. We know that facility practices impact peritonitis rates as well. So just focusing initially on APD use, there's definitely a suggestion that a significant increase in your APD use will lead to a relatively small decreased risk of peritonitis. So for a centre using an extra 10% of their patients using APD versus CAPD, that will reduce the risk of peritonitis for a patient by about 5%. So it's not a massive effect and you'd have to have an awful lot of patients on peritonitis and there are caveats as observational, so it's not proof, but it, it does fit and it wouldn't be a huge surprise, I don't think. Um, we know from better studies, so randomized control studies, that exit site um, prophylaxis has an impact and the magnitude of that effect is about a 20% reduction in risk. And antibiotic prophylaxis at catheter insertion site has a similar level of effect. It's worth pointing out that the UK in the centres and PDOPs anyway, they all use that. So that's why the UK is not included in that in the numbers to the side. And coming to the, the most important slide, this is the overall rates of peritonitis between centres compared across countries. So the international average in PDOPs was a mean of 0.28 ep patient peritonitis episodes per patient year. But you can see there's variability. So looking at the, the lower um, countries, so Canada or has a rate of 0.27 as an average, Japan 0.26, and the US has a 0.24 average. Not quite so good, Australia and New Zealand coming in at 0.36, but as I think Edwin is going to show, they're actually getting better and they're probably lower than that by now. Then coming in last, unfortunately, Thailand and the UK. So you can see that the UK's average is 0 0.40. Now, it's also worth looking at the variability within this. So if you look at the, the, the box and whiskers plot for Canada, you can see that there's not a lot of variability between the centres, and that's why they've got such a low average. If you look at the UK, we've got some centres that are clearly doing extremely well and are just as good as any other, any other centre in any other, any other country. Unfortunately, there are also some centres that are worse than any other centre in any other country. So if you bear in mind that the ISPD standard has a suggestion of 0.5, 10% of the units had a rate above that. Unfortunately, that's disproportionately, to a fair degree, disproportionately in the UK. Now, it might just be that PDOPS data was wrong or misleading or uh, it's just a, a statistical quirk. Unfortunately, the, the data we'd have that exists does support that the PDOPS data is accurate. So this is the NHS England dashboard data. They persist in using the wrong units. So these metrics should all say 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. You can see that the national average in England is coming in at just over 0.4 episodes per patient year. So that fits completely with the PDOPS data. And it's got that same pattern of having some centers that are just as good as anywhere else in the world, some incredibly good units here. But unfortunately, we've got some units that have got really very high rates. And in fact, Scotland's actually got a slightly better history of peritonitis data collection. And unfortunately, their rates are at least as bad as England and possibly even worse. So that's just giving you some feel for the results within the UK. 
there is actually another meta-analysis of published rates coming out. So this is Mark Marshall's work, and he's just done a meta-analysis of published peritonitis rates over time. And you can see that in the past, the rates were much higher. So they, here's the ISPD standard, and you can see that you know, in the 1990s, having a rate of 0.5 probably was quite a good target. In the 2000s, a rate of a target of 0.5 is becoming a bit less ambitious. And you can see that now in, in the published rates, the average rate is round about 0.3. So the ISPD target is no longer looking quite so ambitious. And it's looking like for most countries and most people in, across the world, they're achieving that with room to spare. And then the last point I want to make is that peritonitis, you might say that maybe we're just getting mild peritonitis cates and, and the, the outcome is actually very good and we're very good at getting the, the rates cured. But again, the, I've shown you the transfer to hemodialysis data already. And this is some, again, it's not published yet, but this is uh, the cure rates for peritonitis between the countries and PDOTs. And you can see that the, the UK rates are actually at least as bad as other countries and probably worse again. So not only do we have quite a high rate of peritonitis, but also we're not very good at treating the peritonitis. So just to recap, peritonitis is the commonest cause of HD transfer. There is variable adoption of evidence-based practice. Facility practices do impact peritonitis rates. The UK has one of the highest peritonitis rates internationally, and that's driven by marked variability between the centres. So some centres in the UK are as good as anywhere else. Unfortunately, some centres in the UK are worse than anywhere else. Um, and I would argue that the ISPD target of 0 0.5 episodes per patient year is no longer really ambitious enough. If we want to be getting ourselves down to a comparable rate to countries like Canada, which I think should be achievable, then we can't really view 0.5, getting below 0.5 as sufficient. And I think we may need to rethink what, what our target should be as a, as a country. And then the UK has also got one of the worst cure rates for peritonitis. So that's the end of my talk. So I might now move on. Um, so Edwina is giving the next talk, so I think she's already introduced herself, so I'll hand over to her. Okay, well there's going to be a bit of overlap between Mark and myself, um, which is not the end of the world because reinforcement is a, a key to providing education. Uh, it's fair to say, I totally agree with you Mark, that the ISPD standard of 0.5 needs to be re-looked at. Uh, the, that guideline was published in 2016, which means that the work was probably done in 2015. Uh, and the guideline committee is currently um, revising that guideline, I think with the plan to be publishing it in 2022, and I'm sure they'll be bringing down that rate. So these are my conflicts of interest. Uh, and, and I think the main message and, is that you should know your peritonitis rate. Uh, you've already seen um, the, the huge variation that, that happens. Um, and we, each centre really should know what's happening. Um, think about practices and staffing, think about training techniques, and follow the ISPD recommendations um, for prevention of, uh, of, of infections. You've already seen the data that there's huge variation in within countries, and the same is going to be true within units of um, use of antimicrobials at exit site, use of antifungal prophylaxis. Um, this is data from France, um, which looked at very much um, the same things as what is um, center effects at causing, um, of being related to um, peritonitis rates. And they looked very much at um, at actually what happened within a centre. They didn't have data on, on um, anti-infective trick policies, but they did have data on staffing. Um, and what you can see from here is, is that um, things like home visits, um, both before starting PD and at PD initiation, all um, had an impact on having a lower peritonitis rate. Um, and also the, the numbers of nurses, so both having 
specialized PD nurses and in terms of the number of nurses um, per new patient. So the more, so the, so the, the lower the ratio, so in other words, the more nurses that you had in a unit, the lower your, and that really had a very significant impact on um, rate of infection. It, how, none of that is going to be surprising. So we're going to focus on, on the Australian experience because they've done a huge quality improvement exercise. Uh, and, and they were really very concerned because their peritonitis rate was 0.5 um, episodes per patient year and in New Zealand it was 0.57. And the ANS data registry has been collecting information on peritoneal dialysis and peritonitis for a long time. Um, and their survey again showed that many nephrologists failed to keep ISPD guidelines and that about half the units had no local protocol, um, including prophylaxis against exit site infections. And only 7% of units were using antifungal prophylaxis. And, but the interesting thing that came out from the uh, Australian data is the impact of centers. Well, People will, you know, what units often say is, oh, it's the patients are different. And um, that's why our peritonitis rate is so high. We have such vulnerable patients. But what has come out consistently from the Australian data is the center effect. So the um, green line or the green circles, this is looking at peritonitis rate across a whole range of centers. I um, mean, as you can see, some of them are really awful. Um, and, and, this shows the, uh, is, is the unadjusted data. The pink triangles is where you adjusted it for the um, patient level. And then the blue squares is where you've adjusted for the center um, effects as well. So you have a much bigger um, decrease in variation when you correct it for center level characteristics. Um, and the same is true for when, when you look at, uh, again, centers across Australia, um, when, when you look at the outcomes of treatment from peritonitis, uh, the, the, uh, and, and when you've modeled for the organisms, which is the green, patient level is the purple, and again, you get rid of most of the variation when you've modeled for center characteristics. So it's what it's the policies that we have in the center and the staffing levels in the center that have the major impact on peritonitis rates and on and on cure rates. So they then initiated a huge quality improvement exercise. So they collected peritonitis data by the ANS data registry. This had to be done um, manually. Um, and but it was limited to one page of A4, but the units all bought into this and it was voluntary, but there was 100% participation. They noticed poorer outcomes when practices significantly deviated from evidence-based recommendations. They um, led research projects to generate evidence and look at factors. They developed implementation tools for individual units, for example, um, prophylactic antibiotic checklists, um, the flyers in the emergency department, please send your patient if they have cloudy fluid straight to the PD unit sort of thing. Um, they deliberately organized um, PD academies or short courses targeted to train nephrologists in PD practice. And, and they had a whole series of the things like educational outreach visits, uh, develop standardized peritonitis pathways, media campaigns, small group meetings, etc., to try and improve peritone um, infection management. Uh, and, and then they identified five key domains that had to be uh, to try and improve outcomes. So patients were being selected, use of prophylaxis and timely treatment, looking at social causes of technique failure, patient education and continuous support, and then um, establishment of clinical governance um, and professional standards. Uh, and then in 2010, they developed a KPI project for a PD, national one for PD peritonitis. And the key part of this was a 
it was the registry of the fed back data on a quarterly basis so it was live data um it was uh, based on real time data entry so it wasn't like a year later it was live um, so each unit could benchmark its performance against every other unit um, and, and poorly performing units were encouraged to approach good performing units um, to, to ascertain what their practices were and then adopt them. So what was the impact of all of this? It was clearly a huge amount of work. So this is the published data which was published in PDI in 2016. So here you can see um, a mean infection rate of, of over 0.5 episodes per year. So slightly worse than the UK, but not that much worse. And then as they um, instituted their QI project, the quality improvement projects, this steadily dropped to, to less than 0.4. Um, and then looking at the ANS data registry. So the published data um, in PDI went, went up to 2014, but you can see from the ANS data registry that this has been uh, sustained and in fact even further improvement so that the mean infection rate across Australia and New Zealand, well this is just Australian data I've copied and pasted here but it was similar for New Zealand, um, showing that it was less than 0.3 episodes per patient year. So what can we learn from the Australian experience? Well really know your peritonitis rate um the minimum should be 0.5 but as mark has said we we should be really aiming for much lower rates um per patient year uh and 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 really thinking about our units policies we, we should we should be asking units that do well um what they do well and really key to all of this also is 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 staffing we do need to, particularly at the moment, with the rapid increase that's happening in many units, um, in numbers of patients on peritoneal dialysis because of COVID, um, we need to make sure that that increase in number of patients is actually met um, by an increase in staffing, which I'm afraid isn't always happening. And that's my final slide, and it will be shown again at the end, of various resources that do exist for education to, on infection and, and on other aspects of PD, both on the Renal Association um, website and also on the ISPD website. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Edwina. Um, so we're gonna move on now to Sally, who I think is going to tell us about three things that um, she would do in her unit to reduce peritonitis rates. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I hope I can be heard um, better now. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, thank you for inviting me to speak today. And basically this is a joint presentation with my colleague Toots Anso. And we've been asked to briefly sort of, uh, as what I can understand from Edwina, if we have a magic wand, what are we going to do as lead nurses in our own units? Um, three things that we could think of to improve the peritonitis rates. Um, so I will talk first and um, I will give the floor um, to Toots to, um, to give her speech or her talk um, after. So um, I am based at the Hammersmith Hospital. And just to give a brief background of our um, program, um, we now have a current PD population of 212 on active PD treatment. And that does not include yet the five patients who have newly been newly trained in less than a week. Um, there's one patient who's not dialyzing but has got the catheter, and there's still two patients awaiting training but has got the catheter in as well. Um, just to break down, um, we have 67 patients at the moment on APD and 145 on CAPD. Um, we have a huge assisted PD program of um, 45 and 17 of them on um, assisted APD and 28 on assisted CAPD. Um, our current rates, uh, peritonitis rates, stands at um, 0.3 episodes per patient year. Um, so straight through the question, um, I think uh, talking to um, colleagues, um, 
we do have similar um, views and I think all of us would really have, or if not most of us will come up with really um, familiar and, and sort of different themes. Um, but we've tried, Tut and I will have worked together to sort of look at three different areas that we can expand on um, for, uh, for us to improve in our own units in the future. Um, I've put down number one as a training, which I think it's has got a very big scope uh, and, and meaning for all of us as PD nurses. Um, I've put revisit and follow up. Um, in, in the unit at the moment, we are using a single use, we are a single user um, of PD and uh, our training is done or our da is done um, fully off-site uh, by the external organization. Um, so it is sort of my hope and my vision that in the future we would be able to develop our own training program coming from my background and from my experience uh, i i would have uh, preferred or would like that or wish that in the future we would have the training program on site to our own patients and to become more flexible to our own patients needs i.e looking at um, not only the technique, which we usually look into um, at consistency, we, we should be able to offer flexibility to our patients as well, um, considering a, that a, an acute program like ours, um, expanding quite rapidly, getting acute patients and getting more frailer patients, we should be factoring in um, the, the, the component that our, some of our patients do need some time, for example, to get trained and not everyone learns quite in a different pace. Um, so it's, it's, we can plan everything for our training, but I think it's very essential that to point to, to put across the point that not everything stops on the training day and that it should be followed up with a close follow-up in the community and at the same time uh, in the long run uh, whilst they're in the in, in, in the program um, so as we can know our patients better have them identified who are at risk and continuously follow on with their technique um, saying that we move on to the second point of assisted pd service and i think um, my point here is not again we are a program wherein with a huge number of patients on assisted PD service that is being provided by the external um, organization as well. And I think I'm not just pinning down on the assisted PD service, but we are focusing quite a lot on having to retrain our patients. But uh, I think a point should be made across as well of when do we as staff or as colleagues um, in, in PD actually would look and, and retrain our own technique and our own um, um, competencies in delivering um, PD to our patients. So um, I think it's, it's more um, looking into a wishful thinking that hopefully in the future we would have our own assisted PD service to run as well. I know that my colleagues and in, in the le leading the, um, the PD services uh, would all agree that although it's got quite a lot of managerial tasks to run the program itself and cost savings and all that, but we should also look into the gains on the side of the patients, i.e. the patients would have um, if we are to deliver as, as, as their part of their PD uh, nursing team to deliver this assisted PD service into them, uh, we would have more consistency on the, on the um, service, on the uh, PD treatment that we provide to our patients. And we would be having more control on the competencies of the staff that we are managing on. Um, lastly, um, I think it's, um, uh, quite a difficult um, sort of <laughs> element to uh, point on is the engagement, motivation and peer support of our patients. Um, certainly, uh, it takes quite an experienced staff, PD staff and a skilled eye to have to identify and spot on some patients who are at risk of developing um, peritonitis earlier on. Um, but there, there is also limited um, I do understand quite limited um, support or evidence on this um, with a paper on back in 2015, I think, which has uh, uh, specified that the lack of uh, motivation in, in PD patients 
could it be a new modifier of a risk factor for them developing peritonitis? So I think in combination of the training and assisted service, um, I'd like to see more if I could um, establish more peer support for my existing and establishing established patients in PD and basically get them to be um, engaged and motivated into doing their treatment. Um, I'd like to pass you on to Toots. Thank you. Hello, hi, and thank you for asking me to talk today. My name is Toots and I'm the peritoneal dialysis clinical specialist for the Wessex Kidney Unit in Portsmouth, based at the Renal Home Therapy Hub in Fareham. So currently we have 108 patients who are actively dialyzing using peritoneal dialysis. Of those, we also have 11 patients with catheters in who are off therapy because they've been transplanted or they've transferred to hemo or they've had a hernia repair and they haven't had their catheters removed yet. And we have five patients with catheters in who are waiting for training. 55% of our patient population are on APD and 45% are on CAPD. We also have 11 patients on assisted PD, nine on assisted APD and two on assisted CAPD. And currently our PD peritonitis rate is 0.3 episodes per patient year. So when I was asked to come up with three things that might improve peritonitis rates, um, these are the three things that came to mind because we'd actually looked at this at the end of 2019, because in 2019, our final rates were 0.44, which was a cause for concern. The first strategy that we thought of at the time was to start looking at doing joint visits with our advanced kidney care nurses to visit the patients at home before they started on PD to assess their risk for peritonitis. And I know that Jane Woodhouse and her team in Oxford have developed a risk assessment tool that they use with their pre-dialysis patients to look at this. So this is not to say that we would prevent patients from coming on to PD, but this is more so that we could make sure that they had adequate support to reduce their risks of developing peritonitis in the first instance. The second thing that we were thinking about putting in was the patient um, refresher training, which obviously is something that has been widely acknowledged as reducing incidence of peritonitis, but that in our unit due to low staffing, we hadn't been able to introduce. Unfortunately, that didn't get put into place because of COVID, but it's still on the agenda. The third thing that we were looking at was increasing the amount of home visits to our assisted patients. So at the Wessex Kidney Centre, all of our patients are trained at home and where possible, we visit our patients at home regularly. However, my feeling was that our assisted patients who predominantly are on assisted APD and connect and disconnect themselves, didn't get as many visits because it was perceived that they were already having visits from the renal technicians. And I think maybe this was um, a bit of an error in our judgment and that these patients really should have had increased number of visits so that we could regularly review their technique because they'd already been identified as being vulnerable and that's why they were unassisted. As I said um, at the beginning, this, none of these strategies actually came into play because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But what did happen is that our peritonitis rates over 2020 significantly improved. So on reflection, I think it's interesting to think about why that could have happened. And um, I think mainly that may have been the government's emphasis on hand washing. So not only were our PD patients more focused on it, but they were doing that alongside the rest of um, the UK. It may be because they were shielding in their own homes. So um, they didn't have as many excursions out. What we do know when we do root cause analysis into peritonitis episodes is that often they're caused by patients being on holiday and out of their usual environment. So maybe that would have contributed. Um, also, all of our patients during the pandemic were having weekly welfare calls. And so we were talking to them about checking their bags, about making sure they were washing their hands properly. Um, so that may have uh, contributed. And also we, because patients were very wary about coming into hospital, they were getting more home visits from our PD specialist nurses. 
So with patient shielding, maybe they had more time to focus on their dialysis, less holidays or travel and a strong desire to keep themselves well and out of hospital. However, I'm not sure that this is something we would want to replicate as an infection prevention strategy for the future. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so I think we can now move on to the uh, discussion section. So um, there are a variety of questions already coming up on the board. Um, I think I might take the first one, which is in this UK data, was there an association of centre size and time from BD start to peritonitis, especially for those centres that are doing worse? So I think the questions derive from quite a bit of evidence that suggests that larger centres have better outcomes. The, the PDOPS data on peritonitis showed that there was a difference between countries, actually. In the UK, there was no gain from being in a larger centre, but in some of the countries, and particularly Japan, there did appear to be um, an increased risk of peritonitis with large, I'm sure it was the increased risk anyway, but certainly the UK didn't have any association between centre size and peritonitis risk. Um, but then moving on to the next one, there's a question that's um, for Sally. So I think Sally and Toots probably between them. Um, do you do retraining and follow up at home with patients or in centre? And how has this changed during COVID? So I think you probably partially um, answered that already. But if you'd like to, maybe Sally in particular could. Oh, I think you're muted still. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, yes, uh, we. I've put that on our wish list because um, that has uh, not been the case as at the moment, and and that is one of the things that I would really want to f follow through um, because. Um, we, we already don't have training on site and still we lack on the follow-up side or retraining side of things. So that is one thing that I would really want to get started here in, in Hammersmith. Um, and when it says how it's changed during COVID, um, obviously we, we try to follow up even with just phone calls to reach out to our patients. Again, um, Resources wise, it is quite challenging um, during the COVID and we only have one um, nurse at the moment who's full time in the community who is doing a brilliant job and trying to see uh, and follow, go do a follow up for all of our patients. So, so can I in intervene? I mean, the French data very clearly shows that um, the nurse to patient ratio is very important in terms of peritonitis rates. I mean, being able to visit people at home like, like Toots is doing is absolutely amazing. So, and there's a question on the chat about what our nurse to patient ratio is. So we've got eight nurses and 210 patients. And for the increase of, we've gone from 150 to 210 patients plus over the COVID time, over the last year, and that's been met by one extra nurse. So we're clearly understaffed, and that's why we can't achieve all the, everything that we want to do um, in, in terms of infection control. So interestingly, yesterday, I was having a conversation with Martin Wilkie, who I had asked to be on this um, webinar, but he's on holiday. Uh, and in Sheffield, um, they've also had a 30% increase in patients post-COVID. They've had a reduction in staffing because nurses were um, redeployed during P um, the crisis um, and only just gradually getting back to PD. And they've had a doubling in their peritonitis rate. So it really shows how important the nurse patient ratio is in terms of um, reducing infections. I think I might just. Um point out Graham Lipkin's comment here. So he was one of the two national leads for the GERFT process. And he's, he's put in a comment to say that, uh, point out that they've visited all renal centres in the U, uh, in England, certainly. Um, and they found that home treatment in particular PD was the real Cinderella. Huge variation in staffing, process, leadership, resources and facilities and accountability, including the role of the commissioner. 
There was a wide variation in peritonitis rates and prophylaxis, as we've said, and peritonitis is not regarded with the same rigor as bloodstream infection with the root cause analysis. Um, and just re-emphasizing that this is a major recommendation of the GERF national report, which will hopefully be released any day now. Um, and that KQIP and RSTP are major opportunities which we must take as a community. And um, so that fits entirely with, um, I think, what, what we've been hearing about already so far. Um, so that was just a comment from Graham. Um, but I thought maybe just, do, do, do you want to come back to that nursing patient ratio? Because it's clearly an issue that's um, getting quite a lot of interest. Um, do, do, is there anything more that centres should be doing about that? Do you think that... Do you have enough that four centres to be demanding more nurses? What's and what's the likelihood of success with that strategy? And any recommendations, Edwina? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could wave a magic wand. I can see Richard is smiling. Um, we we've been told that the increase in PD nursing can only happen if we take nurses from hemodialysis because PD has expanded at the expense of hemodialysis numbers going down. Um, and of course, people are always very reluctant to let go staff. Um, so, so this is a national issue that, that has to be um, really addressed by um, the UK. Um, it's going to be called the UK Kidney Association very soon, which is the combined renal association and BRS. And it's going to be have something that is taken on by the PD community. Um, and I'm delighted to see the emphasis in the GERF report um, on peritonitis and, and being able to somehow or another bring this up to more of a national level rather than leaving it to local management um, who just feel they can stuff more and more people onto PD um, without increasing resources. And I think it's pretty clear from the questions that nobody really has a feel for what the correct ratios should be in their units and I think there's clearly quite an appetite for um, some sort of information around that. Um, so just trying to sort through, there's a quite a raft of questions coming up. Um, hi, in a unit with multiple connectology, what will be your advice on the trainer? Should they be segregated or all the unit nurses can cross train the patients? I don't know if Sally or Toots feel able to comment on that question at all. Hi. So um, obviously we only have two different providers of um, dialysis equipment in the UK, um, Baxter and Fresenius. And in our unit, we do use both. Um, so all of our staff are trained on the use of both systems. Um, and our trainee nurses can train on both systems. So I don't know if that answers the question really. And, and yeah, there's an interesting question here from Geraldine um, Endel about rates of peritonitis um, during COVID. And this is something that we looked at across London when we tried to collect um, data on COVID post um, peritonitis. Um, during PD during COVID. Uh, and there didn't seem to be any change in the rate of peritonitis. Um, I mean, we, we have speculated that people hand washing and wearing masks, etc., would make a difference. You said, too, that you have seen a difference. Um, yeah, I, I posed the question to the nurses that are in the PD nurse forum. And of the nurses that came back to me, 70% of them were saying that they had better peritonitis rates in 2020. Yeah. I think what would be interesting is to look at the units that are saying their peritonitis rates improved uh, versus the ones that didn't and whether the units that had worsened rates, whether that was because their staff were being redeployed. Yeah. Because I know we were very fortunate in Portsmouth that we didn't lose any of our specialist nurses. They all stayed working with MPD. We only lost the, the nurses that were shielding. But some other of the units that I've spoken to, they lost more than half of their PD nurses who were redeployed to work in other areas. So I don't know whether that might have had some influence on that. There's another question that perhaps, Frank, you, you, you could answer that 
um, wearing, wearing your hat from the um, guide, access guideline about whether for in, infection prevention, whether you know, what's the evidence for having two cups on the catheter as against one cup? Thanks, Edwin. I typed the answer already, but there is um, clear level 1c evidence that there is less peritonitis uh, rates, um, at least it's reduced, uh, by having two versus one. And it makes sense because you basically have an extra barrier um, in the subcuticular tissue before you can reach the peritoneum um, from outside to inwards. So that's the short answer. And then there's a question from Nicol Shah about uh, rates of peritonitis with assisted PD. I don't know if you want to comment on that, Edwina. Well, I'll pass that over to Richard because he does our local peritonitis audit. Yes, thank you. I mean, I, we, with a large assisted program, we don't see an increased rate of peritonitis. If anything, we there's a signal that we, in fact, we see a decrease rate. Um, and But I think that reflects the fact that there are you know, we are fortunate to work with an external contractor who provides good care. I do think what Sally says that in, you know, in an ideal world, we'd bring those individuals, be able to support those individuals from within a unit, but we don't see much variation, if indeed potentially a protective effect from those patients on assisted PD. So I think it's always worth remembering that the patients on assisted PD are not the same population as the general population. They may be getting fewer exchanges, therefore fewer connections and disconnections, and they have different co burden comorbidities. Thank you. And, and the difference, I mean, the French looked at this in, in big data because the French have got the biggest experience of assisted PD and the data from the RDPLF, uh, which is the French PD registry, um, shows that the infection rate with assisted PD was um, not as good as in people doing autonomous PD. Um, but, but where they had actually trained the assistants who are nurses in, in the French system by the PD team. So they had some PD training as against just picking it up from another nurse that lowered the infection rate. So it does all depend on the training of the assistant, which is, is hardly surprising. So I think we're getting to the bewitching hour or Cinderella hour of when we, we, we come to an end. Um, Amy, can you put up the last slide? Um, we, I just want to remind you all of, of the um, resources that are available from the ISPD and the Renal Association um, in terms of education. And, uh, and I want to um, thank um, the Renal Association and specifically um, Amy, who's been doing it today, um, helping us um, put, put this webinar together and, and mastering the technology. And I want to acknowledge the over, we had 250 participants at one time, um, and we, we've still got 217 of you all here. Um, so I really want to thank you all for taking part um, in, in this webinar. And please feel free to, uh, to, um, to, to actually look at, at, the, uh, at the websites of the Renal Association and the ISPD. Uh, to access their learning facilities. Thank you, everybody.